Welcome to Mom in Mind, where we dive into all aspects of perinatal mental health and wellness related to pregnancy, birth, loss, postpartum, and new parenthood. It's so much more than postpartum depression. We raise the volume on all of these topics in the hopes that someday everyone will have the support and info that they deserve before they need it. Please note this podcast is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Welcome to Mom in Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. In this episode, we are talking with Teresa Wong, a Canadian writer and author of the graphic memoir, Dear Scarlet, The Story of My Postpartum Depression. Let me just tell you, before we meet Teresa, how impressed and in awe I am of this graphic memoir. I got it and I read through it. It's a relatively quick read, but it's so powerful in such a short period of time. For any of us who've had a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder or any complications related to pregnancy or postpartum, There is something in this for you to relate to, and also very specifically how culture plays a part in our experience. There's so many beautiful things interwoven into this story that are, of course, through Teresa's pain, also into her healing, but that are really, really important for us to see and recognize, not only in ourselves, but this book is already having a lot of impact in the world. It was released in spring in 2019, has been featured on NPR and BuzzFeed, as well as in the Paris Review and the New York Times. So let's get into it and hear more from Teresa. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. I am super excited to chat with you today. I love your book. It is just so beautifully done. And for any new mom or parent or really anyone who's going through any of this stuff. It's just so nice to see like parts of our experience on these pages in such a beautiful way. So thank you first off for writing this book. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it when I hear from readers and women who identify with what I've put on the page. Yeah, I know that a lot of people will. And so I'm I'm really excited to share your story and share this book with our listeners. So yeah, if you can just start wherever you'd like with your story. When I first had the idea to write Dear Scarlet, I was actually pregnant with my third child, my son. Mm. And I was in, I think the first trimester and laying in bed and trying to go to sleep. And my mind was just kind of racing. And I was thinking back to when I had Scarlett and my experience in the delivery room and a bunch of images just kept flooding into my mind and I started to cry. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange because, you know, I've had treatment for my postpartum depression twice actually and counseling. And and I really thought I was kind of done with it, but obviously I wasn't. And, you know, I know part of it is probably the pregnancy hormones too, Mm -hmm. but I just felt like I needed to kind of have some closure in a way. And for me as a writer, the best thing I can do is to get a story down on paper. And so that's why I decided to pursue doing a book. I had thought that I might just write it, I guess, in, in prose as a memoir But the more I thought about just the images that were stuck in my mind, I Mm -hmm. I really wanted to draw those and kind of honor those types of memories. And then also because time with a newborn at home alone is really quiet. (laughs) It's, It's a really lonely and quiet time. I thought, you know, doing it in pictures would also kind of convey that feeling better than just with words. Yeah, it is really, really powerful. And the pictures add a lot. And what I love about it too, anyways, from my experience reading it is the words are there and they're so appropriate for the pictures. I mean, they go together so well, but the pictures, I think if you like me have a personal experience, it brings up the feelings that go with it. It's yeah, it's really powerful. I- I think, you know, I've read a lot of graphic memoirs myself mm-hmm. on all different topics. And I've always found that images seem to, they kind of make that 
instant leap from brain to brain and there's no yeah. translation needed like <laughs> totally yeah and so when you see an image that you relate to the feelings that go around that image just kind of come right into you and, and mm -hmm. you identify with it right away and so it's a really powerful thing the, the whole graphic narrative medium yeah, yeah, it really, really is. As I was reading through this, I'm mean, kind of looking at it from two different levels. One, well, maybe even three, just kind of wanting to know your experience for sure. And then also relating to it personally in the places where, you know, my story was similar to you or I had similar feelings. But then also thinking about all of the other moms who experienced these things and how powerful it will be and is that this is laid out in this way that's easy to digest, so to speak. Mm, I mean, yeah. it's, you don't have to sit down for five days. No, um, I, yeah, I, I, on one, I think it was like an Amazon review, someone had written, you could read this in a nap, <laughs> like, <laughs> right. you know, for, during one or two baby naps. And, <laughs> and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that's, I never thought about it that way. But that was important to me that it was manageable for a new mom to read because there is so little time. And you know what? In my first year of Scarlett's life, I read exactly one book. I mm -hmm. never got, yeah, <laughs> never got enough time to read. Oh, like a full book, right? Yeah, one full book <laughs> in one year. Whereas in a normal year, I might read 50, you know? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. So you had this powerful moment for yourself of realizing you needed to get this out on paper and draw it graphically, put that on paper as well. Had you ever done anything like this before? No, I hadn't. I had tried to work on a nonfiction book before, just in prose, and didn't get too far with the manuscript and had put it aside when I got pregnant with Scarlett. And so I knew I kind of wanted to do a book eventually in my life, but I had never thought that I would be able to do a graphic narrative. I, I'm a writer and not an artist, and I definitely was less of an artist four years ago when I started the book. <laughs> and so I actually set out to just kind of sketch it out, and I thought I would have to find an illustrator to collaborate with mm -hmm. to make it into a true work. And so after I had sketched everything out in a sketchbook, um, kind of, you know, almost stick figure style, a little bit nicer than stick figures, I showed it to a few people. And the majority of the feedback was that they just kept telling me, you need to draw this story. Mm -hmm. It's so personal that it would seem strange coming from, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from anyone else. Otherwise, you know, you need to find someone who can draw it exactly like you would. <laughs> right. I waffled on that a little bit because I didn't want my lack of artistic skill to kind of take away from the story. And I was quite worried about that. But for the second draft, I just decided to take a chance and see if I could do that. And so I went out and, well, the first thing I did was I actually Googled how to make a graphic novel <laughs> because I literally did not know how. <laughs> right. And I found this blog post by a very famous young adult graphic novelist named Raina Telgemeier. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. You know her in my house. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Her books are great. Mm -hmm. and in one blog post, she was writing for kids. <laughs> She detailed her whole process, like what she used, down to the type of paper that she bought and, oh, wow. cool. <laughs> and, you know, the blue pencil that she used to sketch things out. And so I looked at that and then I made a list and I went to the art store and basically bought everything that she said to do and to buy and, and followed her process. Obviously, I don't draw like her, so that was the missing piece. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and so I just did it almost naively in a way. But when I had it all done and scanned into the computer, I had a, a manuscript. And, and su surprisingly, you know, the more people I showed it to, no one really talked about how bad the art was. <laughs> It's not uh, bad. It's good. I it love kind it. Of, I don't know. I still kind of cringe sometimes because there's a one panel where I'm giving birth. It's in the delivery room. And it, 
looks like I'm like seven feet tall because I've just drawn it. My proportions are off. Oh, I love <laughs> and <so> it. <laughs> but yeah, and so I'm happy with the way it turned out. There are little parts that I wish I could fix, but on the whole, I think it's so the, interesting. I think on the whole, the art actually kind of adds to the vulnerability of the story. A hundred percent. Actually, as you were just talking about that particular picture of, you know, giving birth and on the table, I flipped to it right now to see what you were talking about. And I guess if I were in your head, I could see that. Um, (laughs) But first of all, I didn't notice it at all. But secondly, like if you're having a hard time, like in your own personal experience through you know, pregnancy and delivery and postpartum, things are sort of distorted anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like our emotional Actually, that's, that, stuff is distorted. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And even just our vision, our view of things. I remember when I brought Scarlett home, I don't know if you ever found this, but I would stare at her for a long time, obviously, because either I was rocking her on the ball or feeding her a bottle or just had her in my arms. And then I'd go and look in the mirror and see my own face. And it looked kind of too big and too Mm. stretched out and too Mm. severe (laughs) because I was so used to looking at this cute little round (laughs) face. Right. Soft, round face. And yeah, it was yeah. just very strange. I do know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's a perfect way to describe it. Uh, yeah. 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 So the book beautifully goes through your story after the birth of your daughter and what your experience was. But would you mind if we go just kind of look into some of those details a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Great. Thank you. So I saw, I mean, there were so many things in there that I want to ask about, but very particularly, you kind of knew something wasn't quite right and sought out help. Initially, Um, you went to talk to a doctor. This was like early on. Yeah. So I'm Canadian. I live in Canada. And the protocol in my province is that 10 days after you give birth, you go to see a doctor no matter what. And so this was part of that checkup. Oh, got it. But I thought, something was wrong. You know, I thought something was wrong even in delivery, like right Mm -hmm. after having her, but Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what was normal and what wasn't. And I had read, you know, in what to expect book about baby blues. And, and so I didn't know. And and so I brought it up with my doctor and just told her that I was not feeling like myself and, and that I was crying a lot. And I wasn't sure if it was depression. And I guess because it was only 10 days after birth, just kind of brushed it off and said, oh, no, no, this is, you know, what everyone goes through and it's called the baby blues and, you know, just you need to get out more, you know, go for walks and Mm. get sunshine and fresh air and you'll be fine. And that was that. (laughs) Mm. And I thought, well, I guess I don't have depression and this is just normal and went home and after several more weeks of kind of suffering through it, you know, I had a kind of climactic moment where I really broke down. And and that's when my husband and I decided that we needed to find another doctor and Mm -hmm. and just get a second opinion. And and of course, diagnosed with postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Right. So up until that point, how long had you been going through this? A month Uh, or two months? Yeah, six weeks. Six to seven weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's quite some time to be Mm -hmm. feeling like this. So during that time, all of those like feelings of what's wrong with me and all that were creeping in? Oh, yeah. I felt a lot of guilt that I didn't seem to have this like enormous rush of falling in love with my Mm -hmm. baby. But I didn't want to tell anyone because <laughs> right, right. so there was shame involved in that too. Mm-hmm. And I had felt a lot of regret too, um, mm-hmm. kind of wishing I could have, you know, pressed an undo button and <laughs> right. just gone back to my previous life. And then guilt around that too, because it's not that I didn't love my daughter, Scarlett, but I missed my old life, you know, sure. and it just felt like I had traded in for a -hmm. life of kind of worry and suffering and (laughs) it wasn't going to end. Like that was the way it was now. It doesn't feel that way. Like this is going to last forever like this. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are going back to the birth itself. I mean, I'll use my like 
therapist words, it seemed fairly traumatizing. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. Experience. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah I, well, it sounds like hard to, you know, even wrap your mind around the motherhood thing because you were kind of in and out of it for a bit. Right. I had a major complication while I was giving birth. I had a hemorrhage. I was going to say postpartum hemorrhage, but I'm not sure if that's completely accurate. It happened kind of during or, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so I had lost a lot of blood. It happened during a a kind of baby boom time in my city. And so the hospital was stretched in terms of resources. And so nurses weren't really communicating with us or Mm -hmm. coming in to see me very often. And so for a few days I was stuck at the hospital and all I knew was that they were checking my hemoglobin levels to make sure that I had enough before they could send me home. And then I found out later they were actually also waiting to see if they could get me a blood transfusion. Oh Um, gosh, you didn't know about any of this? No, I didn't. Uh, All I knew was every day they would say, no, you can't go home today. Like, (laughs) and then they did finally send me home. I was in such a weakened state. Like they sent me home Mm -hmm. with iron pills and, you know, (laughs) But once again, like I didn't know what was normal or not. This is my first baby. And so I just thought, oh, this is how you feel after having a baby. But really, in reality, I had lost half my blood and no one, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. can function very well that way. Um, (laughs) Besides the lack of sleep and, you know, just the regular trauma of giving birth. Postpartum Support International just launched an online perinatal mental health provider directory. All providers on the directory have completed specialized perinatal mental health training and are ready to help pregnant and postpartum families. The directory allows families to connect with a knowledgeable perinatal mental health provider in their area. Right now, it's available for U.S. and Canadian providers, including mental health, psychiatry, affiliated professionals, and support groups. You can search for a provider using different criteria, such as zip code, insurance carrier, or language, to name a few. Visit psidirectory.com to connect with a provider. Or if you're a professional with training in perinatal mental health, you can submit a profile online at no cost. Your provider profile can be easily updated and can include your social media, videos, and practice highlights. So for those of you providers out there who have not yet submitted an online profile and you have perinatal mental health training, get in on this so that families in need can find you. Postpartum Support International provides direct peer support to families, trains professionals, and provides a bridge to connect them. Visit PSIDirectory.com for more information. <laughs> right. Oh, I don't mean to laugh, but just yeah, I know yeah. there there's a lot going on there. The, the regular trauma. I, yeah, I love that. In a lot of ways, I love that. Right. So it's like the start of motherhood was fraught. There was a it lot was. going on. Yeah, and I think a lot of it would have been alleviated if someone had explained to me some of those things that mm. you know that this isn't normal. You're going home with you know, very low iron and Mm -hmm. you're going to have trouble. Um, Even if someone had just told me that I was going to have a lot of trouble breastfeeding and, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) or trying to breastfeed and sleeping and just having energy. I just couldn't figure out why I, you know, just sitting and holding her and holding a bottle was draining me of all my energy. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Right. When you don't have the context for what is actually happening, and I believe in your experience, what I saw in the book is similar to what a lot of people do is blame themselves. Mm-hmm. think there's something wrong with them. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't until a few months later, like after I had been diagnosed, I ran into a friend who was a nurse and I told her what my hemoglobin level was when I left the hospital. And she said, that's like a zombie. No, <laughs> <You know>? no. <laughs> and yeah. she was surprised they even let me leave. And, and oh, wow. so, yeah, it was that put a better frame on it anyways mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, right. Manage kind of the expectations around what you can do so that exactly. you don't just feel bad. Exactly. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot. So at what point did your mom come Basically, right away after we got home. So in Chinese culture, I'm Chinese Canadian. My parents were born in China and immigrated to Canada and then had me and my brother. And I grew up in Canada, but I was raised with 
a lot of Chinese traditions. And one big tradition after you give birth is you kind of spend a period of confinement at home. And so you aren't supposed to leave the house with the baby or by yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that I think in, you know, kind of pre-modern times, that was really to keep you safe, you know, from getting sick or, you know, Mm -hmm. getting hurt in some way. But I found that it's a very valuable time for a a new mother. And I'm glad that we had that tradition because there was no expectation for me to go out and get groceries or, you know, Mm -hmm. do errands or bring the baby out. Everything was brought to me. Uh, My mother brought me food all the time, kind of traditional healing foods from our culture. And it was the only reason we went out was to go for, you know, mandatory visits to the doctor. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it was a time of rest and recovery. Mm -hmm. And I think there are similar periods of confinement in many different cultures, too. And and I think it really kind of honors the change that comes when you become a mother and (laughs) the transition period. And so... All of that part was good. Unfortunately, the other part of it is that you're very isolated that way. Mm -hmm. And it's really just you and the baby and your family near you. And you kind of, for me, I kind of got in my head a little too much because of that. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so I did do the confinement with all three of my children, Mm -hmm. but after the first time, like with my second and third, I kind of made an extra effort to invite people over and have more people come into our home to, you know, kind of prevent that sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, the the first time was a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And you're still feeling weak and with all of the support that you had with the foods and whatnot, I'm assuming that the rest helped. But that isolation was still that kind of mental game. Yeah, it was. It just gave me a lot of time to think and ruminate and wasn't necessarily healthy for me mentally at that time. Right. But I still, you know, again, I did it again with all three of my children and I don't regret that part of it. That's fantastic. It's so nice that to have a cultural practice that is supportive and available to you. I if think you want so. To, yeah. yeah. And just, you know, like the fact that I didn't have to cook, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was a really lovely thing. <laughs> right, right. Especially um, by the time you got to the third baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, by then it wasn't even isolating because there were so many people in the house already. <laughs> right. Right, right. That is quite a lot. So you did, after that period of time, seek additional professional help? I did. So I was diagnosed officially as six weeks postpartum Mm -hmm. with depression. And I got in to see a psychiatrist who specialized in postpartum mental health. Mm, And so... That was really good. So I began seeing my counselor once a week and then also began a course of medication. I took Zoloft and that was, I think, very helpful too. And then my treatment lasted probably about for another nine months. And um, that's when I felt kind of comfortable to stop both the medication and the counseling. Uh, But not unfortunately, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) ironically, I guess I got pregnant like the week after. (laughs) Oh boy. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Or discovered I was pregnant with my second daughter the week after. (laughs) Got it. So, well, good that you got to a place where you felt better. And it looks like in your book, you also kind of go into a little bit of what that was like postpartum. Do you mean having another baby or? Yeah. I mean, I can ask you this kind of off topic and at the, towards the end, you kind of felt okay for a little bit and then you didn't. Yes. So I was doing well and doing really well in my second pregnancy and we were really, you know, very hopeful and prepared for just a better experience all around Mm -hmm. (laughs) with my second. And so I had a doula after I was 
diagnosed with postpartum after Scarlett. And she was in the delivery room with us the second time and, you know, came home with us. And she was a lactation consultant as well. And so she helped me learn how to how to breastfeed because I really wanted to try that, um, having not breastfed with my first. Yeah. And so everything, I think, went really well. And then about eight months in, so a lot later than with my first, that the postpartum depression came back. And at first I was like super disappointed in myself because <laughs> I thought, I, you know, and I had all these supports. I was all prepared and, you know, I knew what to watch for and we mm-hmm. prioritized my sleep and, you know, it's already been eight months. Like, why is this happening again? Mm, right, um, right. But at least, you know, the best thing about it was that I knew what it was right away. Right. And I knew how to get help right away. And so I went to a new counselor because my previous one was actually on maternity leave. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> and with her, we decided to try, instead of going on medication, decided to try doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that process. Like, I really feel like the strategies and skills I learned doing CBT have now helped me ever since then manage oh, great. my mental health yeah, issues. And with my third, I didn't have depression. I mean, we checked in during the, the pregnancy and, mm-hmm. and after just to make sure. But yeah, I feel like doing the CBT kind of gave me what I needed to deal with my negative thoughts and oh, great. That's <laughs> and, so uh, negative self-talk. Yeah. And kind of to recognize my thoughts for what they were and, to, mm-hmm. <laughs> and just, yeah, be a little, I guess, more resilient and able to manage my emotions. Wow. I just love a good recovery healing story. You went through it. You were, you know, really having a hard time after Scarlett, not with Scarlett, but specifically after in that postpartum, well, birth and postpartum. Mm-hmm. And I just, the the healing journey that you've been on, it sounds like it was, you know, a big change in your life, um, mm-hmm. having kids and, and all of that. But it's also has this other side where it's helped you in other ways. I think so. I really feel like, you know, because I recognize now I that I had gone through depression, you know, even before having babies untreated and undiagnosed. And so, you know, now I'm just so much more aware of what those feelings are and mm-hmm. how to handle them. And, you know, when I go through times of depression now, and I have, I know that it will end, you know, <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, and that I will be able to make it through. And just I'm a lot gentler with myself. And if I need extra support, I know how to get it. And That's so good. So yeah, it's been a really eye opening experience. Like I don't, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not happy I had postpartum depression, but I am happy with the skills and the strategies that I've gained from dealing with it. And, right. and I really feel like it's going to help me, you know, going forward for the rest of my life. Oh, that's fantastic. It's such a beautiful transformation. Hmm. And we all get the benefit of this book that you've put out. And I'm curious, have people's reactions been about the book? And yeah, um, I've gotten... I think basically only positive reaction. Mm -hmm. It's really lovely to hear from people like all over Canada and the United States. Just a lot of people reach out to me and tell me their own stories and how Mm -hmm. the book has helped them get through it. And, or um, there was one example I, I really love of a woman who was reviewing the book for an online site called the bustle. Mm -hmm. And she, I think, had an eight-month-old at the time. And as she was reading the book to review it, realized that she herself had postpartum depression. Yeah. Um, And yeah, yeah, she kind of saw herself and thought, all this time I've been thinking I'm a bad mom. 
but really, I think I just have postpartum depression. Oh my God. And she wrote this in her review. That's awesome. <laughs> and she wrote about going to get treatment. And wow. um, yeah, oh, when I read to cry. When I, I know when I read that story, I started to cry. Because, uh. Like someone, it actually helps someone realize, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and get help and hopefully have a better time in motherhood. And uh, yeah, and that means everything to me. Totally. Um, I, you know, to be honest, I didn't write the book with that intention to Mm -hmm. help Mm -hmm. people. I mean, I'm glad it does. And when it got published, I realized that it would be helpful. And But I wrote it for myself, right? And to kind of get those feelings out of me and to help myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it's just such a pleasure to see that it's resonating with women and hopefully helping people feel seen and supported. Yeah, I know that it does. I can tell you firsthand. (laughs) I've been in this field for years now. And, you know, I still find bits and pieces of my own story and other people and realize that there are still some vulnerable spots in there. And, you know, even after all these years, it affects you, you know, it sort of, it leaves a mark so to speak, not a bad one, just, just one, but, you know, reading through these parts, where I could still see myself and sort of be connected to those feelings, it's still powerful. I mean, there's still like, oh, wow, I could maybe use a little more healing in that spot. You know, that's another thing that I've noted when talking with people about the book, when people come up to me and tell me their stories is a lot of the women are, you know, in their 60s or, you know, had children like 20 years ago or 30 years ago and are still touched by it. Because yeah. this, it, it just brings you back to that time. Like, <laughs> you know, you can move on from it and heal from it. But yeah, it's still in there, in there quite strongly. It's, it leaves quite a strong impression. It does. That, I feel like another powerful, as I was, again, using my like several levels of thinking as I was reading through this, because of the way you've done some of these little sections, they have like banners, like in particular, (laughs) one that has like your depressed mind, you drew a picture of your head and then all these parts of your brain. Like when I saw this in the book and other parts of the book like this, I'm like, oh, this is a way for someone who's suffering to just show it to somebody else. Like, look, this is this. This is how Mm -hmm. I feel. I can't explain it to you. I don't have words for it, but this is what it looks like and feels like. That's interesting. I've and, never thought about it that way. <laughs> but, well, but yeah, I'm, I'm constantly yeah. <laughs> looking for tools to give to my clients and moms mm-hmm. who are suffering to be able to bridge that gap. Because mm. if you don't, if you haven't been through it, it is really, you know, hard to wrap your mind around what somebody's going through. And the person who themselves is suffering can't always find words to explain, explain Absolutely. it to anybody yeah. else. Absolutely. Um, uh, when my husband first read I think I showed him the first draft, actually. Mm-hmm. He read it all in one sitting and then like closed the book and just started crying. Yeah. <laughs> and then he said, I just didn't know, like he knew I had postpartum depression. He knew, you know, I was suffering because he could feel that, mm-hmm. obviously, and, right. and experienced it, you know, right next to me. But he still had no clue. And, you know, and mm-hmm. so I think, uh, yeah, I hope the book is valuable for people who are supporting new mothers too, you know, whether it's a spouse or a parent or a caregiver. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I see the potential in all over this book for that as well. It's really powerful. The visuals again are just really bringing home. Well, if you can, you know, considering the experience you've had and what you've seen now on the other side and having written this book, what would you tell to a mom out there who's having a hard time? I think the main thing is to be gentle with yourself. Don't talk to yourself negatively. Talk to yourself like you would to a good friend that you love, not the way you would normally talk to yourself (laughs) if you're anything like me. (laughs) And that these feelings are normal, but they need to be treated. And if you can get help and find at least one safe person to talk to at the beginning that that would be the first step and then also that it ends like this is a treatable medical condition it's not something that you have to just live with and power through you can get help and there's all sorts of help available if 
you're into medication, that's one route. Counseling, talk therapy is another route. Those things combined can work. There's a lot of different treatments out there. And so I urge you to just seek help, ask for help and receive it. Beautiful. Thank you. That was perfect. I was like in my head having like cheering for you as you were saying all of this with (laughs) pom-poms over here, (laughs) because that is all so true. And I, in addition to this beautiful book that you've written, I hope people can really hear what you just said as well. So I hope so too. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time to come on and share this with us. Oh, no, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the work you're doing and just furthering the conversation around motherhood and mental health. Uh, Thank you so much. I hope that those of you who are going through a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder or who have been through one or therapists out there, providers who support families going through this, get this book. It is such an easy read, as I said before, and it's really powerful. And I have myself have handed this to clients in session to specific pages that I remember resonate with their experience. And oh my gosh, to be able to see something that you're going through reflected in a book when you can't imagine that anybody knows what you're talking about is really powerful. And it's also super useful to not have to explain everything you feel to somebody else. So learn more about this book at buyteresawong.com or find her on Instagram at buyteresawong. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. For those of you who are new to the Mom and Mind podcast, please subscribe to get all of these episodes downloaded directly to you and share, share, share. The more people who know about the resource of this podcast and know about the resources of the guests that we have on here, the more people we can help. Let's continue to get this message spread widely that... People going through perinatal mood or anxiety disorder are not alone and that help is available. Thanks for being with us. Until next time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please share this podcast. Together we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Come connect with us at momandmind.com. Mom and Mind.